So today's lecture is on a few topics um, that uh, you probably don't know a lot about. So we're going to go through in a little bit of detail. And as usual, sort of my goal is to show you sort of the real science behind things, not just some sort of metaphor for what's going on. So we're going to get into a little bit of detail about how genes work today, more than last time. Um, but then also to bring in sort of why it matters, why it's important that you know these things, um, how it impacts how you think about issues that will affect you in your daily life, as opposed to these technical scientific issues that won't affect you in your daily life. Um, and so today we're going to pick up on uh, one of the questions that, or two of the questions actually that we asked last time. So we have, uh, what is a gene? And if you remember from last time, what we started doing was sort of defining this in real sort of chemical terms. You know that it's a stretch of DNA that has uh, a particular code uh, that's, that can be read out from it. And um, we're going to talk more about the complications of that code today. Um, we also talked last time about you know, the beginnings of how that code is read. But again, it was just sort of a, a, a vocabulary thing that codons, triplets of DNA bases get trans translated somehow into the 20 amino acids that are found in proteins. But we, we didn't really go into detail about how that actually works. So um, we're going to talk about that today. Um, and then this big question, which, I, as I said, was sort of going to permeate the course, um, is one we're going to return to today and, uh, and talk about um, in terms of once you do have some knowledge about how genes actually work, what does that let you do in terms of understanding really complicated and important things like, for example, human behavior. And then we're going to um, also talk about sort of how we go about as scientists, as geneticists, as genomicists, uh, how do we study DNA? Um, not just how do we know what it is, how do we know the information it encodes, but, but how do we actually, in the laboratory, day to day, take this molecule and, and do experiments and learn something from them? Um, and, and part of that, as you'll see, is something called genetic engineering, um, which I think more and more people are, are becoming familiar with, at least in a general sense, because of various debates that are raging about genetically modified foods, for example. Um, and so we're going to talk about, start to talk about what genetic engineering is and some of the concerns that came up when it first became available as a technique. And uh, throughout the course, again, we're going to revisit um, its, its uses today and whether those are safe um, or worthwhile. OK. So what is a gene? Um, last time we, we sort of ended with this slide. Um, we have this double helical molecule of DNA. Um, and so we were able to define that a gene is some portion of this molecule. OK, so I'm showing it in red here, right? Um, it's a stretch of DNA that corresponds to an RNA molecule that is, that is made. OK, so remember, DNA carries information. And the way that information is actually used is the DNA gets copied into an RNA. The RNA leaves the nucleus, goes to the ribosome, which is in the cytoplasm. And the ribosome can, cha can uh, convert that messenger RNA information into a protein. OK, so we can define a gene in part as this stretch of DNA that will get copied to make a messenger RNA. Um, and then. Something, again, that's going to come up uh, in, in future lectures more. But I want to make the point now that I made last time, which is that every single cell in your body has exactly the same DNA. Okay? So what makes different parts of your body, different tissues, different cells different from each other is not the DNA they contain. But to a first approximation, it's the RNAs that they make from that DNA, which RNAs actually get made and which RNAs don't get made. For example, in your, in your um, blood cells, you have white blood cells, you have red blood cells. Those do different things. They require different proteins to do those things. And so uh, hemoglobin, for example, which carries oxygen, is made so that it's in your red blood cells. But it's not made in your white blood cells. It's not made in many other cells of your body. Okay? So the important information is not just this stretch of DNA that gets converted into a messenger RNA that gets converted into a protein. But there also have to be instructions in the DNA that say, when and where does this piece of DNA get copied into a messenger RNA and then made into a protein? Okay, And so I'm calling that here on this slide, this blue part, 
I'm calling it associated DNA that controls when transcription happens. That is when this DNA is copied into an RNA. Um, I'll also call those sequences regulatory, okay, in the sense that they control what's happening. Okay, now we have to get into a little bit of a complication about messenger RNA. So I lied a little bit when I made this slide and everything I told you yesterday, uh, or sorry, last Wednesday. Um, it's not so simple that there's a stretch of DNA and it gets copied into a message and then that gets translated into a protein. Um, and you remember from the one clip I played last time uh, from Francis Crick where he was saying, you know, the logic of, of all this biology is really beautiful, it's really elegant, it's really simple, but then the details are messy, okay? And this is one example where the details are messy. And that is because um, these messenger RNAs, when they're first made, are interrupted by sequences that don't end up in the final messenger RNA, okay? And, and they get taken out by a process called splicing. So the first thing that gets copied from that stretch of DNA that's part of a gene is what's called a pre-messenger RNA. That pre-messenger RNA has parts of it that are the parts that actually contain triplets of bases that code for protein, okay, code for amino acids in a protein. That's what I'm showing in red. Those are called exons. In between those parts in red are parts that don't obey that triplet code. They have nothing to do with the final protein that's going to get made. Those are called introns. And what happens is inside the cells, first this pre-messenger RNA gets made, and then a set of enzymes called splicing factors take out the introns and make this thing. So this is a detail. I mean, uh, you probably could get away in this world without knowing that introns and exons existed in genes. But in some cases, it actually becomes important because some diseases are caused by the failures of, of pre-messenger RNAs to get spliced properly into messenger RNAs. A lot of the complexity of life um, that exists is caused by differences in how this, these splicing reactions take place. And so it's a detail I do uh, sort of want you to know something about. Okay? And uh, on, your, on your DVD, there's um, a nice animation of, of splicing, and there are interviews um, with two people who are very famous who have something to say about splicing. Um, the discovery of splicing was a very interesting and unexpected one, as you might imagine, because everyone was expecting this elegant one-to-one -one relationship between the DNA to the RNA to the protein. Um, and it turns out the RNAs are more complicated and have these things in there. Um, and so, um, for the most part, you can usually sort of ignore that there are introns. You can think about a gene just sort of coding for a protein. Um, but it, as I said, in some cases, it matters. Um, sometimes introns are part of what we call junk, and that's a technical term. Uh, so as we'll get to in a couple of lectures, you have three billion letters of DNA um, in your cells. And, and not all of those carry information. Okay? The ones that don't, we call junk. It's just sitting there and doesn't really do anything. And I think you'll be surprised at what proportion of them are actually junk in your, in your cells. OK. So now we have a much more sophisticated, complicated chemical definition of what is a gene. So now I'm not drawing the full do double helix, but this black line you should be seeing in your mind, this double helix of DNA. OK, so that's just part of a chromosome. It has two intertwined strands of DNA. And then what does a gene look like? Well, a gene, in part, is a place along that string of DNA where transcription starts to where transcription stops. OK, so transcription, again, is DNA being copied into RNA. right? And so um, part of what a gene is is this stretch of sequence that's uh, between where that starts and where that stops. And as you'll learn in future lectures, that's, those are both very well controlled steps. Okay, so it's not random where transcription starts and stops. There are signals that tell transcription where to start and where to stop. Okay, so that's part of what the gene looks like. As I said, um, there are also these sequences associated with the gene that are the control sequences. And in a couple, couple of lectures, you'll see one of the most uh, sort of famous examples of how DNA sequences next to this transcribed sequence um, control uh, the activity of a gene in a, in a very sort of sensible, logical way um, as, it, as it pertains to how a bacterium sort of lives its life and makes its living. Okay.
We'll get to that in a couple of lectures. But for now, all I want you to know is that there will be cases that I want you to understand where there are sequences here that tell the gene when to be transcribed. And we'll get into how that actually can, can work. And then, as I said, this thing isn't just one uniform block of DNA letters. Uh, it's actually broken up into parts that will end up in the pre-messenger RNA. That's the whole thing. And then parts that will end up in the messenger RNA, the mature final messenger RNA, only the red parts, the exon. The introns will be spliced out. Okay. And now, the other thing to know right, is that so transcription and translation don't start at the same place. Okay. So you saw the genetic code last time. That's that table that has all 64 combinations of uh, a, ACGT in three positions. Okay. And one of those is what's called the start codon. It's AUG. AUG is what all proteins start with. Okay? It's called the start codon, and it codes for the amino acid methionine. Now, transcription can start somewhere ahead of wherever that start codon is. So you could have, you know, A A A A A A A A A A U G, and then go on. Okay? So transcription might start here, and then translation of a message would actually be further in. And, the, and so if you consider this whole transcript, this whole pre-messenger RNA, there's a part of it that codes for the protein, but not all of it. Okay, So the introns do not code for protein, because those get spliced out. And then there are these parts at the beginning and the end that don't code for protein either. So part of the gene is what we can call the coding sequence. And the coding sequence goes from wherever in the mature messenger RNA translation starts. So right there, we would know there would be an AUG. And then continue on in triplets, continue on in triplets, continue on in triplets, continue on in triplets, until it hits one of those three codons that say stop, that don't code for an amino acid. They code for the word stop, which basically makes the ribosome finish that protein. Okay? So this is a lot more complicated picture. Um, but the different aspects of, of it are important, because as we go through the course, you'll hear examples of you know, defects in, in where uh, protein synthesis is, is, is starting, or where splicing happens, or things like that. Okay? So these little bits at the end, just to sort of finish our vocabulary here, are called untranslated regions. So untranslated regions, that, that name makes sense because the part of the messenger RNA, that would be this, that has the, those actual triplets, those codons, is the coding sequence. And that coding sequence is translated by the ribosome into protein. And so the part that's not translated is the part here and here. And that's untranslated region. OK? Any questions about that? Um, so is the, the coding sequence a part of the mRNA, not the pre-mRNA? Well, it's going to be both, right? Because everything in the mRNA is in the pre-mRNA. Right? There's only things that are taken out from the pre-mRNA. Um, to get the final mRNA. So coding sequence will, will be in both. Introns will only be in the pre-mRNA and not the mRNA. Okay? These untranslated regions will be in the mRNA. Okay? They're red, too. They're, they're extons. So is what we're looking at mRNA? So what we're looking at, yeah, so that's a really good question. The question is, are we looking at mRNA? What we're looking at is DNA, okay? because these regulatory sequences are part of DNA. The part that gets transcribed into the pre-mRNA is DNA and then DNA. So imagine this as your, a chromosome. It's a close-up view of part of the chromosome. Okay? And so what's going to happen is that this sequence from here to here is going to get copied into the pre-mRNA. The pre-mRNA is going to get processed so that these parts are chopped out of it. Okay? And then that, M, that produces the mRNA. The mRNA goes from the nucleus to the ribosome, and that mRNA is going to get translated. The part of it that's translated corresponds to from here to here on the DNA. Okay? So on the DNA, this would be ATG, right? But in the mRNA and the pre-mRNA, that's AUG. That AUG is the part on, this, on the messenger RNA that the ribosome sees and says, OK, I'm going to start making protein here, methionine, <coughs> next, 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 next. Okay, so what I want to, sh want to show you now is sort of how the ribosome works, how the ribosome takes a messenger RNA and actually makes a protein out of it, because it's not obvious, right? You have, 
DNA, which is in the language of these nucleotides, these uh, um, bases that contain sugar, phosphate, and nitrogenous base. Um, and proteins are in the language of amino acids. Okay, so it's not obvious how those, you get a code that comes from nucleic acid and you make it into a protein. Okay, and there's actually a machine, many, 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 many copies of that machine in every one of your cells that does the job of converting the messenger RNA information into the protein. Those are called ribosomes. And what I want to show you now is the animation for you. This green adapter molecule, obviously inside your cells it's not green, right? Um, but it does have this triangular shape. Um, and this molecule is actually made up of RNA. It's not a messenger RNA. It has a different initial up front, T, that's for transfer RNA. So the transfer RNA's job is to line up with the messenger RNA and to deliver the right amino acid. Okay, and so we can sort of make a schematic version. So this is a complicated version that shows all the atoms, right? All the, the sugars and bases of the um, of the transfer RNA. We can make a schematic that's a little bit simpler. It's usually drawn something like this, um, and it basically has two parts that are important. Okay? It has what's called the amino acid attachment site, so that's what's up here. This is where an alanine or a glycine or a glutamine, one of the 20 amino acids, would be attached. Okay? And it would be the right amino acid corresponding to whatever the three nucleotides are down here. Okay? And this part down here is called the anticodon. So a codon is a group of three nucleotides. So a nucleotide is just an A, U, G, or C, right? A codon is a group of three, right? That's what's red. And an anticodon is what reads it, okay? So you can imagine that an mRNA molecule is snaking through the ribosome, and in this position it has AAA on the messenger RNA, okay? What would the anticodon be for that? AAA. U, 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 okay? So the same rules that tell DNA how to pair tell RNA how to pair. So if you have AAA down here, you have U, U, U down here. That's how it knows, okay? So the, th the important thing, though, is when you have one of these t transfer RNAs and it has U, 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 it will always have the same amino acid here. That's what makes the genetic code work. It's not random which amino acid you have there. Okay, and so the process that you are seeing on that animation, if we look at a static picture of it, looks like this. And this is a, bit, a busy picture, but I want to just sort of point out the important parts. Okay, so again, down at the bottom, we have the messenger RNA, mRNA. Okay, and these codons come in threes, right? And they're sort of fed through the ribosome. And so you can see that this AAA codon was matched up with a UUU anticodon, right? And that UUU anticodon is on a transfer RNA molecule that has a particular amino acid, okay? That's what this R5 is meant to, meant to depict, okay? And the way the ribosome works is it, is it does sort of two codons at a time. So you have this AAA codon and this UCG codon. This one has its anticodon, this one has its anticodon, UCG goes with CGA, right? You have base pairing there. These two transfer RNA molecules are inside the ribosome at the same time. You might have picked that out in the animation that they were sort of marching through two, and then they slid over, and there was a new one here, and then they slid over, and there was a new one here, okay? So two of them are inside the ribosome at any one particular time. And so at this other end, this attachment site, are where the amino acids are. So this one has amino acid number five and amino acid number six in this protein, whatever they are. And what happens is when these are put close enough together inside the ribosome, this chemical reaction can take place where this amino acid is joined to this one. And then what happens is they slide over and the next one comes in, okay? So as this process keeps ratcheting forward one at a time, you're adding amino acids to this growing chain, and that was that red part that's coming out the top of the ribosome. Okay? So the right way to think about it is as a machine. Okay? So the, the machine is 
making sure that the codons line up with the anticodons, making sure these two things are close enough to each other so that they can become attached, and then threading them through up out the ribosome, and the next one just comes, a, comes in as this marches along. Okay, and it really is a kind of, you know, lock in place, move, lock in place, move. Okay? Just like an assembly line that's churning out this polypeptide chain based on what this sequence is. Um, so when you read the um, one anticodon is CCA, does that mean that um, when you're translating it into a protein, the first letter is C, the second letter is C, and the last letter is A, or do you need a second letter? So we always have a directionality, right? So, yeah. so the messenger RNA, the beginning of it is here. Yeah. Okay, so that's why I was reading the message this way. I was reading AAA, UCG, GUC. Right. Okay, and whenever there's complementarity, you have this upside down situation, right? So um, if I have UCG here, I have CGA there. This CGA is all read together, okay? It's always in blocks of three, okay? The CGA is attached to this um, transfer RNA, which is attached to that amino acid, um, and that's what gets attached there. Right. So okay. when Ah, ah. The first, so that that is is a codon table. Oh. Okay. So that's U C G. Oh. Good question. Okay. So you're gonna get, not in this week's lab, but next week's lab, you're gonna get plenty of time to think about the genetic code and how it gets converted from RNA into protein because you're gonna go through an exercise that simulates how the genetic code was actually discovered. Okay, because think about it. I can come up here and tell you I know that AUG codes for methionine. Okay, but that means at some point in time there was a scientist or a group of scientists who figured that out. Okay, and so in lab next week you're going to go through sort of that process of how you actually figure it out. And I'll give you a hint of how it works. They were able to synthesize messenger RNAs chemically so they could make one messenger RNA that had all U's. Okay, it would just be U, 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 which would make a very boring protein because every codon would be exactly the same. But because of that, when they got the protein out in the end, they could say, aha, uh -huh, this protein has only one amino acid and it's this. So that's how they know UUU corresponds to a particular amino acid. Okay? And if you go through that enough times, then you can actually build that entire genetic code table. And what's nice about it is you can do that in one organism and it applies to every other organism on Earth. Okay? We all share the same genetic code. Okay. So, right. So, on your own, I encourage you to go back and look at that animation again and try and sort of pick out all the parts, pick, it, pick out how this ribosome is working. Okay. Um, but what I want to get to now is, re is sort, of, sort of to remind you how quickly sort of the scientific view of what a gene is changed. Okay. And we basically have approximately 150 years of history. It's not a very long time at all. Okay. And so if you go back all the way to Mendel, a gene is a unit of heredity. Okay, it's something abstract that can't be seen, but you can see its effects by doing crosses. We got to the middle of the 1900s when it was clear that DNA was the genetic material, when the structure of DNA was figured out by Watson and Crick. And so the definition of a gene shifted to this molecular definition. A whole field of molecular biology was born. And so instead of having this abstract unit of heredity, people began studying DNA and its properties. Up until today, where we have a very modern definition of what a gene is. It's a transcribed sequence, so it's a part of DNA that gets converted into a messenger RNA. All associated regulatory sequences, the sequences that control when that messenger RNA is actually made. Okay? But if you think about what, what's missing in this definition, is the whole idea of what's actually being inherited. Okay? Mendel was in his garden studying pea plants. He was studying whether the seeds came out yellow or green, wrinkled or smooth, what color the flowers were. Right? So he was very, very, very focused on traits, observable features of organisms. Okay? He didn't know anything about the molecular basis of those traits in, the, in DNA. Okay? Fast forward 150 years, and now we know enormous amounts about DNA, about the molecular basis of, it, of heredity, 
But the task now is now to connect that to traits. Okay? Most of what biology is about is understanding how genes control traits. Okay? So what we're going to switch to talking about now, and what we're going to talk a lot about in the course, is how DNA tells you something about an organism. Not just that there's this string of A's, T's, G's, and C's, but how knowing that can help you really understand better why this organism looks different from this organism, why this organism behaves different from this organism, why this organism is diseased and this organism is healthy. Okay? So we're going to start with very, very simple examples. Okay? And one of the simplest examples is um, the example that was worked out uh, in the beginning of the 1900s up at Columbia in the Morgan uh, Fly Lab. And that is that there's a gene, obviously, that has some effect on whether the fly's eyes are red or white. Okay? And it turns out that it's a single gene that controls this. And if you have one version of the gene, the normal version of the gene, the fly's eye is red. And if you have a mutant version of the gene, that is some change in the DNA sequence of that gene, the fly's eye is white. Okay? Single gene, you can follow it in crosses the same way Mendel followed the inheritance in crosses. Okay? And we now know what that gene is at the molecular level. Okay? It's a gene that encodes a protein that is a pigment transporter. So a pigment transporter is something that takes a pigment that the cells make in the eye and it puts it in the right place. Okay? And in fly's eyes, there are actually two pigments that combine to make this red color. Um, and neither one of those pigments gets to the right place when this pigment, pigment transporter is not working. Okay? So here's a very, very simple example of how a mutation in a gene that we can understand at the molecular level. We can say this A is not an A anymore. And then, therefore, this protein is not made properly. And therefore, we don't have a functioning pigment transporter. And when you don't have a functioning pigment transporter, you get white eyes because the pigment's not placed in the right spot. Okay? And so um, what I just went through for you there was, it was probably one of the most simple examples of what we call the conversion of genotype to phenotype. Okay? So the genotype is what version of the gene that encodes this pigment transporter you have. Okay? And the phenotype is whether the eyes are red or white. Okay? And so Here's a very, very simple example. You have one version of the gene, the pigment gets up in the right place, eye is red. A different version of the gene, pigment doesn't get to the right place, eye is white. Okay? Very simple relationship between genotype and phenotype. Most traits don't have such a simple relationship where a single gene determines the outcome of the trait. Okay? But there are some, even in humans, that have a very, very similar simple mapping of genotype to phenotype. Okay? And so one example is sickle cell anemia. So these are red blood cells, okay? healthy red blood cells, and so-called sickle well red blood cells. Okay? As I mentioned in the first lecture, it's a single DNA change, one letter spelled wrong in the DNA that causes this to happen. The gene encodes hemoglobin. If, if the protein sequence of hemoglobin is not right, then the red blood cells take on this sickle shape. Okay? Just one error in one gene causes this to happen. And this has very, very, very dramatic consequences, um, causing a very se severe disease um, because it leads to a very severe anemia. Um, and on your DVD, um, they have a really good an animation that, that goes through sort of the connection between hemoglobin and these sickle cells and what happens to these sickle cells in your bloodstream. Um, it also has an interview with a patient who has sickle cell disease. Um, so you can really get a sense for you know, how a single letter out of three billion letters can really affect someone's life really, really dramatically. But in this sort of, uh, uh, sort of scientific anti-emotional mode, we can, we can think of it exactly the same way as the fly eye color. You either have the right version of the gene or the wrong version of the gene, one spelling mistake, and, and you get a different phenotype, a different uh, appearance of the trait. Another simple example in, in humans is called uh, phenylketonuria, or PKU. Okay? Again, it's a single mutation in a single gene that leads to uh, an improper protein. 
Okay? And again, it causes a really, really serious disease. Okay? So what's happening here is there's a gene that encodes an enzyme, okay? and the job of the enzyme is to process phenylalanine. Okay? Phenylalanine is one of the amino acids in proteins, um, and it gets converted into other amino acids, and if it builds up, it can become a toxin. So your body's ability to process phenylalanine is really important. Okay? And what happens is if you have a bad version of the enzyme that, that processes phenylalanine, it leads to a very serious disease. It causes impairment of brain development, other symptoms. Um, but what's amazing about this is that you can completely eliminate the disease by changing your diet. Okay? And that is all you have to do is be careful about how much phenylalanine you're eating. And so you avoid foods with phenylalanine. Sometimes when you're looking at a label um, on certain uh, soft drinks or chewing gum, it'll say, warning, fetal ketonurics. This, pro this product contains high levels of phenylalanine. Okay? So if, if, if you're born with this mutated form of the, the disease, you can avoid the disease pretty much completely uh, just by a change in the diet. So this illustrates two things. It illustrates, an, again, a simple example of a connection between genotype and phenotype, a messed up enzyme causing a really, really serious disease. But it also illustrates another point, which is that genes aren't everything, right? And so the environment, the nutrition of an individual can completely overcome whatever genetic deficiency there is in this case, okay? Again, this is a very simple example. We have a one-to-one -one situation between gene, disease, and cure for the disease, okay? Um, and because it's so simple, it's one of our earliest examples of being able to have a intervention that affects a genetic disease. Every newborn in the United States is tested for PKU at birth, okay? Because what you want to do is immediately, if you know a newborn has PKU, then you start this altered diet so that they never have a problem with brain development and so, so on, okay? Um, most human traits, and many traits in, in other organisms that we might care to study are obviously not so simple. Okay? It's not a single gene changing, leading to a change in, in phenotype. It's not a simple environmental change that can alter what that trait looks like. Okay? And so I, w I just want to sort of make the obvious point, which is that most traits are not at all simple. Okay? Most of them, most of the ones we care about, involve a very complicated interplay between more than one gene sometimes many genes, and more than one environmental variable. And in almost all cases, where that complexity exists, we don't understand it. Okay? And so if you think about the common diseases in humans, like heart disease, diabetes, mental illness, these are things that have very complicated causes that to some extent involve genetic differences, to some extent involve environmental differences. There are debates as to how much it's genetic, how much it's environmental. And the reason there are debates is because we don't know, because it's complicated, it's hard to figure out. So what I want to do now is play you a few short clips of scientists basically demonstrating how our, in, our information is incomplete and therefore severe disagreements can occur and they're mostly due to preconceived notions of what's true as opposed to actual knowledge of what's true. Okay, and so these are the clips I'm gonna play. And they're really dramatic in terms of how much the disagreement actually is. Okay, so here's, um, who did I wanna play first? And I want to make this point, I'll make it briefly, that um, this is a really scary situation to be in, right? That, that there isn't enough knowledge, but people are acting on presumed knowledge, okay? And sometimes that gets really, really, really dangerous and serious. Um, does anyone know what this is a picture of? Uh, right, it's, it's from Nazi Germany. It's the Nuremberg law, laws, okay? And what were those laws about? Eugenics, although they weren't using that word, what the it was about racial purity, 
right? So these are all sort of family trees, right? Explaining that if you, you know, if your grandparents on one side uh, were Jewish or not Jewish, and your grandparents on the other side were Jewish or not Jewish, whether you count it as Jewish or not Jewish, okay? And you know, they, it, it, it's scary how sort of detailed it was, you know, how pseudoscientific it is, right? Drawing these sort of pedigrees, which are, you know, not that different looking from, you know, the pedigree I would draw if I was drawing across a fruit flies in the laboratory, right? And so this sort of pseudoscientific sheen on top of it is, you know, is what's really dangerous because, you know, what does it even mean? It's, it's not even a, a, a real scientific question to say, you know, if your maternal grandmother was Jewish, then you're Jewish, right? There's, there's sort of, there's, there's no scientific basis for doing that. Um, but obviously happened, and, and so I think it's, it's, a, it's sort of the prime example of how sort of limited scientific knowledge combined with uh, extreme sort of arrogance and, and nefariousness can really, really, really be dangerous. And as I said in the first lecture, it wasn't limited, um, you know, this was not just Nazi Germany. In the US, eugenics was seen in its early days as a, as a progressive movement, and it led to mass sterilization of people who were presumed to be genetically inferior, okay? Um, so this is the kind of thing that scares me when we get pronouncements about, you know, human behavior based on genetics that are premature, because um, people can take that and run with it, even though there really isn't a huge scientific basis to, to work from. OK, what I want to do for the rest of the lecture is uh, shift gears a little bit and tell you um, some more about answering the question about how we study DNA, OK? Because what I hope I'm doing here is sort of motivating you to, to learn more about genes, right? We can't say anything intelligent about racial purity laws or sterilization laws or what we should do to help people with schizophrenia or um, to, to have a society that appropriately makes sure that all students can you know, reach their full potential in elementary school unless we gain some better understanding of our biology um, and also the limits of, of, of how that understanding can apply to all these things. And so part of that is really sort of using the information in molecular biology, in DNA, in genes, to try and learn something about the world and so what I want to start talking about is sort of some of the really basic fundamental techniques of how we study DNA. And this is stuff you're going to do in lab. It's going to be stuff that comes up throughout the course. And it's really important because this is how pretty much all the information in the course from now on, where it comes from. OK. And so the question we're going to start with is, what is a clone? Um, and so you probably have this idea in your head about what a clone is. Uh, we talked about, in the first lecture, the sheep Dolly, who was the first mammalian clone, clone from an adult cell, okay? So um, her mother, in a sense, was her twin sister. Um, and, and so a clone, in a simple de definition, is basically an exact replica of another living thing. And cloning in biology really got its start with very simple organisms. Um, and you actually saw an example of, of sort of a very primitive kind of, of, of experiment involving clones. And that was in the Griffith experiment. Um, and that is that bacteria, many species of bacteria, just sort of naturally take up DNA. OK? And so, and then they just divide and, and replicate that DNA and make many, many more cells. So in a sense, uh, a copy of that original DNA gets copied you know, billions of times within a relatively short amount of time. And each of those billion cells that inherited that original piece of DNA is a clone of that original cell. Okay, so in bacteria, we're not just talking about a sheep and its mother sister, but we're talking about you know, sort of billions of, of genetically identical cells. Um, and so cloning first got its start in biology really with, with sort of very simple manipulation of little pieces of DNA. Okay? and just making lots and lots and lots of copies of that DNA. And the way that was done was to harness a naturally occurring type of DNA that bacteria normally have and use um, in sort of evil ways to make us sick. Okay? And um, 
Some of you might have heard about this with regard to particular uh, bacterial diseases. But bacteria, in addition to their normal chromosome, have little pieces of DNA that, that are called plasmids that are you know, anywhere from maybe 1,000 letters to 10,000 letters of DNA, sometimes more. Um, and, and so that's usually much, much smaller than the normal chromosome. Imagine it as sort of like your extra little chromosome that carries your really important genes. Um, and in the case of bacteria, one of the really, really important types of genes that they have are antibiotic resistance genes. That is, genes that make proteins that either counteract or inactivate or get rid of antibiotics that we're trying to use to kill them. Okay? And so we weren't the first people to try and kill bacteria. Uh, bacteria in their natural environment have enemies, fungi, and other things. And so many of the antibiotics that we use in hospitals, in medical practice, come from fungi or bacteria that naturally make them, or we've made minor alterations to those things. So for many, many, many millions of years before humans existed even, um, bacteria had ways of, of getting rid of antibiotics or neutralizing antibiotics. And we just discovered recently that we can sometimes use antibiotics to kill bacteria, but they've been sort of dealing with that for a long time. And so what a lot of bacteria have are these little chromosomes, little circular chromosomes, that contain genes that make them resistant to particular antibiotics. Um, and so what, what's depicted here is basically you know, DNA. And then part of that DNA is a gene that encodes some protein that makes the antibiotic neutralized. Um, in the, let's say, around 40 years ago, uh, scientists figure out how to sort of hijack these plasmids to make them carry, instead of antibiotic resistance genes, the genes we want them to carry. Okay? And the idea is that you can take one of these plasmids, add your own piece of DNA to that plasmid, and then what you have is called a recombinant plasmid. And then the bacteria don't know any better. They'll keep making copies of this plasmid. And so they'll give you many, many copies of this piece of DNA that you care about. Okay? So what's also shown here is that we also hijack and, and sort of take advantage of this antibiotic resistance. So normally, if, you, if you're worried about your health, antibiotic resistance is a bad thing. You don't want your bacteria to be resistant to antibiotics uh, because then you can't get rid of them easily. Okay? But we can turn it around and say, well, these plasmids normally contain genes that uh, confer resistance to antibiotics. So this is an example that confers resistance to the antibiotic ampicillin, which is related to penicillin. And then if we always grow these bacteria in the presence of ampicillin or penicillin, um, then only the cells that contain this plasmid will survive. OK, does that make sense? We have a way of sort of selecting the cells that are making the antibiotic resistance protein. Okay? Normally, you would not want to do that. You would not want your doctor to do that. right? Um, but um, in the lab, it's very useful, because what that means is if you know you've inserted your DNA into a plasmid that confers resistance to a particular antibiotic, and you always grow your bacterial cells in the presence of this antibiotic, then you'll know that your DNA is there, too, okay? because they're attached. So it's using this resistance as a marker to tell you that your piece of DNA is there. Okay? And so here's, here's basically the idea. And you're going to do this in lab. You're going to what's called transform bacteria. You're going to take DNA that you want and put it into bacteria and see that your DNA is actually there. Um, and so what you do is you take your recombinant plasmid, and we'll talk probably at the beginning and next time how you make a recombinant plasmid. Um, you mix that with bacteria. So the common laboratory bacteria are E. coli, which come from your gut. Um, and you do a little trickery. You add some calcium chloride and some heat, which is exactly what you're going to do in lab. And then what that does is it makes the bacterial cells sort of open up a little and take up more DNA. And so just by mixing E. coli, with a plasmid like this, with the right temperature and the right salt, um, the DNA will enter the cell. And then what you do is you, is you grow those cells in the presence of the antibiotic ampicillin. 
And what happens is if a cell took up this DNA, because not all cells do, um, then that cell will do great, because it'll have this gene that confers resistance to ampicillin. So those cells survive. But if another cell doesn't get the plasmid, if it doesn't inherit that plasmid, if it doesn't take it up from the outside, it won't be resistant to the antibiotic, and it will die. Okay? So just by growing the cells in the presence of the antibiotic, you're going to make many, many cells that look like this. They have the normal E. coli genes, and then they have these additional genes, including this piece of DNA that you care about. And you can grow up billions of cells like this. You can grow up billions of cells, and then, as you know, you can get DNA just by uh, you know, using the right combination of chemicals. Um, and so you can get your piece of DNA back. But instead of just one piece of DNA, you now have billions of pieces of that DNA, so you can actually do something with it afterwards. Okay? And so what we're going to do, um, and, and so this just sort of finishes the story, the plasmids replicate inside the cells. The cells that have the plasmid replicate further. And so you get many, 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 many cells, each of which carries the plasmid in the end. Um, and so what we're going to pick up on next time is how you actually get the piece of DNA you like into the plasmid, and then what you can do with that kind of technology, how cloning a piece of DNA actually gets you somewhere. Okay? So um, any questions about that?